Good morning. We welcome you to Union Presbyterian Church. And we are glad you are here, and we invite you to stand. It's a beautiful day to be celebrating together God's love, God's mercy, God's grace. And we begin with our call to worship from Psalm 34. Please read the all with me. I will bless the Lord at all times. The Lord praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will boast in the Lord. All who are afflicted and downcast can find hope in the Lord. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. The Lord, the Lord delivers, delivers me from, from all, all my fears. fears. Let's sing together. We have so many reasons to praise the Lord this morning.
Lord, we worship you in the spirit of the truth. We invite you into our service this morning. Bless us as we bless you. You may be seated. If you are enjoying the music that you hear every Sunday, our band is working a little extra hard this month to prepare a wonderful Thanksgiving uh, concert for you, and you'll hear some special music maybe that you've never heard our band do. So I hope you come out for it, and you'll hear more in the announcements. And it's Thank this you. Saturday. And it is this Saturday. This so there are flyers Saturday. out there, and they have our pictures on it. And just give them. It's a great way to tell people about our church and say, hey, come and celebrate Thanksgiving with us with this concert. It's going to be gospel music. It's going to be high energy. I hope you'll come. So great. thank you. And now we're going to hand it over to Lori. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Amen. Hallelujah. God's grace is enough for us, right? Right, well, we have something special today. Today is our Hallelujah Harvest celebration for the kids, right? We want to give God thanks. And one of the special things we're going to do, the kids have a special praise song they've prepared for you guys. So Slavi's going to lead us. Where is Miss Slavi? Slavi's going to lead us. Kids, why don't you come on up front here, and I want you to stand up on the steps. Stay standing and face the audience out there. Face the congregation. Stay standing, and Miss Slavi's going to lead us in a song 
give thanks because this is a time where we give thanks to God. So all the kids, come on up. Let's see. Come on up, everybody. We've been practicing this song. Come on, all you kids. You get an extra prize for Hallelujah Harvest when you sing. Come on. We need all the kids up here. Let's go. Encourage them, everybody. Can you encourage the kids to come on up? All right. Hallelujah. Come on. We need all the kids up here. All right, I know they get a little shy. All right, Miss Slavi, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you. God bless you, sweetie. Amen. Hallelujah. Kids, that was beautiful. Now go ahead and have a seat on the steps. We're going to have our kids' message. Beautiful singing and praising to God. That's one way that we give God thanks is to, is to sing our praises to him, right? Great job, kids. We're going to have the treasure box come on up now. All righty. Thank you, Miss Slavi, for leading the kids. That was beautiful. You know, today's, um, we celebrate the birthdays on the first Sunday, but we have someone in the house today who has a birthday today, and he wasn't here when we had the crown, so go ahead and open up the treasure box. Where's Mr. Tyler Morris? All right, can you stand up back there, Tyler? Everyone say happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Tyler. How he gets to wear a crown. Let's give him that crown. Justin, are you gonna, is it your birthday? Oh, you want to give him the crown? Go ahead and hand that over to him. Hallelujah. And Daisy's going to celebrate her birthday tomorrow. I think Joseph had his yesterday, so it's a wonderful month of birthdays, right? Oh, and we have cake. Uh, Daisy brought cake today. So everyone who comes over to the party gets some birthday cake. Hallelujah. We love to celebrate birthdays. Well, today's kids' message is give thanks, just what we sang earlier. What does it mean to give thanks? Yes, Diana. What is Yes, yes, to be thankful. To give thanks, you have to be thankful. Yes, that's natural, right? So what does it mean to be thankful? I, we're going to go to London and then to Minchan. 
Yes, to be thankful for what you have. Hallelujah. Minchan. Being grateful and thankful, right, for the things that we have. Matthew, why don't you come up here? I can't hear you so well back there. Believing in Jesus. Yes, we have thanks in our hearts when we believe in Jesus. Let's see. Anybody else? Do you have another one? Don't be angry. Yes, when we're thankful, right? We're not going to be angry so much. These are beautiful things. Yes. Well, when we say thank you to someone, it's because we do have joy in our hearts. We're grateful for the things that we have. Maybe someone gives us something. Yes, Lisa. Don't get more. Don't get more. Yes, I love that. We always want more. Boy, that's so prophetic. That's beautiful. You know, we can say thank you, right? But we're always thinking about what am I going to get next, right? What else do I get? That's beautiful. Yes. So we have to be thankful for what we have, what we already have, right? Well, let's see. Let's look and see what um, is in the treasure box. We're going to celebrate something today, right? Can you hold this up, please, for me? That says Hallelujah Harvest, right? Today is our Hallelujah far Harvest when, you know, at Thanksgiving time, we're giving thanks to God. We're supposed to give thanks all the time, all year round, but at Thanksgiving, we take special time to say thank you to God, right? It's our celebration today. When we say the word Hallelujah, it means we're rejoicing in praise to God. We have the joy and the thankfulness in our hearts, right? We don't just say, sometimes you can say thank you for something and then just walk away and not really appreciate. But what, what true thankfulness, giving thanks, is that in our hearts, we truly appreciate what we've been given or what we have. Yes, Diana. Yes, sometimes you, you get excited, you open up a present, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting, I have this present. And then you're kind of like, okay, what next? I want to wait for it, what else am I going to get? So yeah, we don't want to be like that. We want to appreciate every gift. We want to show people that we appreciate it. Okay, the other thing is hallelujah harvest. What's the harvest? What's the harvest mean? Actually, let's go over here. What's harvest? Gathering food. Yes, Minchan. Eating the food. Yes. Raking it in, yes, bringing it in, right? So when we have a harvest, a gathering of things that are planted, right? It's the time of reaping and bringing things in. Justin. Yes, when you harvest, you gather the food and then you save it for the winter. I know I was in Russia in winter one time. Man, they have to save their food all, get, get ready in the fall and then save it all through the winter. Anything else? All righty, that is true. We have to save it. So it's a time when we gather, and we, we gather all the harvest, all the good things, the seeds that we plant. We plant the seeds in the ground, right? And then we water them, and we watch the things grow. Eventually, when we harvest the things, we do gather them, and we do spread it out. We want to save our food so that we have it for eating later. We don't want to eat everything all at once, right? Well, God, well Jesus, I think he's in the treasure box today as well. So Jesus says another thing we plant are seeds of faith, right? When we believe in Jesus and in what God tells us in the Bible, then we have joy and thankfulness in our hearts because we know that Jesus paid the price for our sins. And when we believe in him, he promises us a place in heaven with God forever and ever. And we're supposed to share that good news with other people. You know that? We're supposed to plant the seeds of faith in other people's lives. And when we plant those seeds of faith, we're, we're telling people the good news about Jesus. And Jesus said the harvest is when all the believers come together under, in God's name, right? We're going to come together in Jesus' name one day. We're going to all be in heaven. And then also we ask God to send laborers, send people to help us bring other people into his kingdom. Yes. Yes, the seeds, the seeds, think of the seeds as like they're people, and God's going to gather them in heaven one day. And actually, when we gather here in church, we're gathering together as part of the harvest. The Bible says that we're supposed to pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. You know, it's not always easy to give thanks. Jesus suffered, but he still thanked God. The apostle Paul suffered, and he was still thanking God. He said that we're not supposed to be anxious or worry about anything, right? We're supposed to pray to God and and give him thanks when we're praying for other things. And then he said, his peace will guard our hearts and our minds. So remember that we have joy in Jesus, and because of that joy, we can give thanks in all circumstances. Let's pray right now, and then we're going to have something special afterward. Dear God, you are mighty and amazing. Your love never ends. 
We have many reasons to give thanks to you. We thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to pay for our sins so that we can be set free from all sin and sadness, from all sickness and hardship. Lord God, Jesus, we ask you to come now and fill us with your joy and your peace. Bring your healing and your deliverance to all who are struggling or suffering. Help us to pray continually, Lord God. Help us to rejoice in what you've done. Help us to be thankful and have thankfulness in our hearts in all circumstances. Help us to plant the seeds of faith in other people's lives and then water those seeds and help them to grow. Lord God, we thank you for all the birthdays this month. We pray you bless everyone celebrating. Thank you that we can be uh, celebrating thankfulness in our hearts, your hallelujah harvest today. We ask you, God, to let your light shine in us and through us all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, kids, one more thing we're going to do. You know, one way that we give thanks to God is by giving to other people. You see these shoe boxes up here? Those are all Christmas gifts that our church has packed. They're going to go to kids around the world. So Pastor Dave is going to come up and bless those shoe boxes and bless the kids who are going to receive them. Hey, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the, the hands that prepared these boxes. Um, I ask, Lord, that, that these would be seeds that would go out to the very ends of the earth to, to let people know that little kids know that they are loved, that they are valuable, not just to, to the people around them, but to, to everyone, that they are a valuable person, that they are known and loved by you. Lord, let these be seeds that flourish and grow, uh, grow into real belief in who you are. We pray all these things and bless these, these Christmas boxes in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, kids, we're going to have our Hallelujah Harvest celebration. Go through those two doors and go to the green tablecloth, the table with the green tablecloth. Hallelujah. All right, good. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Slavi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I am going to remember that Lisa said it's important to not get more because uh, her, her birthday is coming up in a couple of weeks and, and Christmas is coming up too, so I'll hold her to it. <clears throat> so announcements. So the first announcement always is that, that there are... Um, in the pews, there are connection cards. So if you would like to sign those, they are also online. You can re request uh, a prayer from our prayer group. You can let, give us your, your email and start getting us connected that way. That would be very helpful to us. Um, could you go to the next one? Thank you. Ah, so the solid ground, what, what, what Jamie and, and uh, Randy were talking about. So next Saturday night... Here at 7 o'clock, uh, the, the gospel, it's a quartet minus three, trio, I guess. The gospel trio called Solid Ground is going to be here. They're going to be performing. If you'd like to meet them ahead of time, they're having a meet and greet at 630 in Bailey Hall. Um, and the, the praise band is, is doing a couple songs that I'm excited about. One is the I Lost My Bible Blues, written by Randy. So I'm excited to hear that. Um, so that's next, this upcoming Saturday. Uh, it's coming quick. It's amazing. I've got two sermons, and then we're into Advent, and one of them is going to be over pretty soon. Um, I'm just floored by that. Um, so there is an opportunity also for people to host folks from uh, different countries for Thanksgiving. So <clears throat> we are connected to a group up at Stanford that, that ministers primarily to international students to let them know who Jesus is and, and whatnot. And as a part of that, they try to connect those folks to actual real families that are celebrating Thanksgiving to connect them uh, and, and give them the experience of, of a real Thanksgiving, but also to connect them to Christians. So uh, if you're interested in doing that, uh, there are a number of people around here who have hosted folks in the past, the Morrises. I know the Hoogs have as well. And, and from all accounts that I've heard, it's been a really excellent um, experience. So if you'd like to do that, there's information in there, or you can talk to me or Mark Morris. Ah, so one of the things that we have here at Christmas is poinsettias. And um, a while ago, there was this poinsettia 
cross made by Ted Brown, and it's huge, and it goes up there, and it holds 14 different poinsettias, and they are only a dollar a piece at Home Depot, but they don't last very long. Home Depot, on the day after Thanksgiving, opens at 6, and all the dollar poinsettias are gone by about 6.10. So, if anybody is interested in coming with me, uh, we'll probably need to leave from here about 5.15 to go get in line. If you go get in line at 6 o'clock, you probably won't get very many. So it is early, and it's cold, and it's miserable, and I know I'm doing a good job of selling this, but if you want to come with me, you are more than welcome. I would love to have you uh, because I can only buy 12 at a time. Um, so, uh, and I'd like to get more than that because it takes more than that to fill up the cross. So. Uh, if you're interested. And then this slide is a great slide, and it's wrong. Uh, we're doing the hanging of the greens actually the day before on Friday. Uh, Carol Hoog is in charge of, of decorating, and so we're going to be decorating when she can be here, which is on Friday. So Friday from 9 to 12, and then if there's stuff left over to do, we'll do that again on Saturday. If, you're if you can only help on Saturday, give me your name and, and I'll give you a call if there's an opening, if there's more stuff to do on Saturday. Okay, membership class. We are having a membership class coming up on the 27th, the first day of Advent, 7 p.m. It's going to be in Landell's room if you want to come in person, or uh, it's going to be online as well. So if, you if you're interested in that, let us know, because we need to get you some materials ahead of time. It'll be mostly informational. Um, it won't be too taxing. We won't yeah, we won't be quizzing you at the end of it. It's, it'll be okay. So um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, yeah, let me know. Uh, our November Bible verse, if you could all say it together, it's from Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Okay, our... Oh, right, we need to take the... <laughs> so, um, if I could get the, the, the... If we could do the tithes and offerings. Um, we know the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and um, pastors get cheerful too when we see the, the, the tithes coming in. So, if that plays into what you're thinking, that would be helpful. Um, anyway, uh, it goes to support missions both here and abroad. So, please, please give generously. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good gifts that you give us that we may be able to bless others um, through our giving. Thank you for the ability, um, the freedom to give. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to cut the Old Testament reading a little bit short, um, so hopefully that won't ruin your day. <clears throat> I will sing of your this is psalm from Psalm 89, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. 
With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God feared in the counsel of the holy ones, great and awesome above all that are around him? O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. There we go. So that's just, yeah, I needed to make up a little bit of time. We're running late. You know, uh, Kaidi's parents in Estonia live in the house that belonged to Kaidi's maternal grandparents. Um, in the years that I have known them, they have fixed up the house considerably. It used to be one of those Estonian houses that had the sticks on top, just bundles of sticks, but now it's got like a real roof and everything. Um, it's, it's amazing the, the amount of work that they've put into it. Kaidi, and so that's, that's in a little town called Esna. Now, Kaidi grew up in, a, in a, a place called Petri, which is about three or four kilometers away, and she grew up in a Soviet-style apartment. Um, and the people in Petri were there mainly to work on the collective farm, and Kaidi's dad was one of the managers, if not the manager. I haven't figured all that out quite yet. Um, and it was actually really nice of the Russians to assign Kaidi's family to, where, to an area near where her grandparents lived so that they could know them. Um, and I've met both of Kaidi's grandmothers before they passed away, but I never met her grandfathers. And the reason I bring this up is that that's how life was for most of, of the civilization. Most of history, people have lived their whole lives in relatively small, concentrated areas. They... they they farmed the same ground that their, their parents farmed, that their grandparents farmed, their great-grandparents farmed. If your job in the village was shoeing horses, you did that for the same families, generation after generation after generation. If you were a builder, you would build for the same people. And, and your kids would build for their kids, and, and their kid, you know, your grandkids would build for their grandkids. It was like that. When I lived on Long Island, People there also have long roots, these deep family connections, because they've been in Long Island a long time, uh, and they have these deep family connections, one to another, that, that I, as an outsider, when I was there, I could never have hoped to have broken into, much less, and my kids couldn't either, and probably could, their could, kids couldn't have either. either. Um, you know, in California, it's interesting, California, most of us are from somewhere else, Right? Um, uh, now, I have to say that my great-grandfather uh, built a house in Pasadena, and so I have been here, and my family's been here four, five, six generations, which actually is, is pretty long-term for Californians. But my own family has been all over the state. I was born in Modesto. My sister was born in Monterey. Both my brother and sister, my other brother and sister, were, were born near Thousand Oaks, um, my mom now lives in Pasadena. She's retired to there uh, and lives about eight-tenths of a mile from, from the house where my grandparents lived when I was growing up. And they live about three miles, she lives about three miles away from the house that my great-grandfather built, which has now been turned into a dentist's office, I think. Um, and my point is that we live in a fairly unusual time in history compared to everybody else uh, in the history of civilization because we're very mobile. Um, we think very little of picking up, you know, selling our house and moving across the country to a new job. And as I say that, you know, it's interesting. My family is dealing with a little bit of a conundrum. When my family immigrated from, from England, uh, being chased out of there for a for an interesting reason I can tell you about later, um, they purchased a, a big plantation down in Georgia. And my family has, it, the, the, there's a, the remaining 55 acres is still ours. Um, a lot of it was lost in the Depression, but we still have these 55 acres, but we don't know what to do with it because I can't remember the last time any in our fam anybody in our family went to Georgia. Um, 
But it's kind of a shame because that family, that, that property has been in our family for hundreds of years. And so what I'm talking about is this lack of stability that we have. We are just a lot less stable as a society than we used to be. Used to be, if your father made shoes, then you were going to make shoes. You were going to live in the same village making shoes. You were going to marry the girl in the hut next over. And you're going to have children who would make shoes for that village after you died. And that's no longer true. So this is what we're talking about in Philippians. This is uh, Philippians 4. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, that is how we should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, fellow yoke, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and may the peace, God of peace, be with you. Let me pray for us. Lord, this is your time. This is your book, and you have ministered through generations uh, of people, through it, with it. And, and I ask, Lord, that you would continue um, to use the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts on your word to mold us and, and shape us uh, to be more like you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So stability. We want it, but there's not too much of it around. And when things are unstable, um, we just flew back from L.A. yesterday um, and there was some turbulence, and I was very glad the plane has stabilizers. Um, boats have stabilizers, too, for when it starts getting choppy. Ancient societies were stable. You knew back then what your point in life was. You knew who you were, what you believed. You were handed stories from your ancestors, and, and that's what life was about. But in our society, we need stabilizers. Paul lived a really turbulent life, Right? always in and out of trouble, um, but he was stable. He didn't waver. Um, first verse, Paul is telling them about standing firm, about stability. Um, I, last week, I mentioned that Christian camp uh, that where, the, where the guy said that he hated the camp because he made him a Christian. Remember that camp I was telling you about? Campus by the Sea. So this is what the part of it looks like. And at the bottom, there's that that rock jetty formation, and it's been there. I have, you know, we, I started going there when I was five, and that rock jetty has just been joyful for me the whole time. There's all th sorts of things to do and find to fish off of there. At the very bottom, there's a big rock, and you can climb on it and look out over the water and just think about life. It's just, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's been there for so many years. It's I bet millions, billions maybe, of waves have, have hit that rock jetty, and it's still there. It's been through countless storms. It'll be through countless storms. I'm hoping to take my family there uh, next summer, and those rocks will still, still be there. I mean, a rock is stable no matter what's going on around it, and that's what Paul was like. And so what he did for the Philippians at the end of this letter is he gives them this principle for stability and then a few methods of application. In our turbulent worlds, being stable is going to look different than everybody else. It's going to be different, and that's not bad. So the big principle is exactly this. Use big truth in little places. In the seemingly little places in life, use cosmic truth. That's the idea. Now, if you are looking for peace and stability, and you go to a seminar, or you buy a book, there are they're always going to go right to the method. You know, do these, do these steps, do these things. Um, and, and because they're not going to start with 
you know, the bigger questions in life. You know, what, is, what happens when we die? Is there a God? I mean, are, is there any meaning to life? How do we know anything about anything anyway? They can't start there with the big cosmic principles, the big ideas, because they want everybody to buy the book. They don't want to exclude anybody. So they always go straight into process rather than starting with these cosmic truths. But Paul says you've got to start with the cosmic truths. You've got to start with the principle. So verse 1, he says, that is how you should stand firm. And that's actually a reference back to 320, which says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. And then from that idea, Paul transitions into this this conflict that's going on in their church. He says, look at the larger picture. Now, I want you to see how this applies. This disagreement, I want you to work it out because life changes. No matter how great your health is, someday it'll start to fail. No matter how great your friends are, they're going to leave one way or another over time. No matter how great your marriage is, at some point, one half dies. Love does not last in this world. No joy lasts in this world. No strength lasts in this world. And that seems so wrong to us. And that is because we desire a stability and it's something that we're, that's innate in us. We want love to last. We want joy to last. We want strength to last. We want marriages to last. And the reason why is we were created actually for a different place, a better place, a place where God is on the throne and says, behold, I make all things new. In the presence of God, things don't get older, they get fresher. Things don't weaken, they get stronger. Instead of fading, they get brighter. Paul says that our world is decaying, but there is a better place that doesn't decay, where God is. And then he says in verse 1, this is how I want you to stand firm. And then he gets into the conflict between Yodia and Syntyche. This is what Paul does. He takes the small conflict, and Paul, Paul puts it into context of redemptive history. This is how he does it. He reminds people that the, of the larger picture because the larger picture helps us figure out our priorities in the mundane. Paul, you'll notice, doesn't get into processes for resolving conflict. He doesn't say, okay, here's step one and here's step two, here's step three, and then at the end of that, you're, you should be complete, re, completely resolved. Um, there is a place for that in our lives. But it isn't where Christianity starts. It never seems to be the, the way Christians have dealt with stress and problems through, through the time. Christians who were fed to the lions didn't need conflict resolutions. They needed to be reminded of this grand sweep uh, that God is doing to bring creation back to himself. So in this little matter that was apparently such a big deal to the church that the messenger brought that to Paul in Rome from Greece and then all the way back, Paul says, look, you're both citizens of heaven. You will be glorified. If your minds are focused on that truth, what are you doing? Think of Christ on the cross. And if you're doing that, how can you still be petty and divisive? Paul doesn't tell them to agree. He says, you have to agree in the Lord. And what that effectively means is, Don't you see what you have in common? Can't you see the big picture? Lift your thoughts. And that's how Paul deals with everything. He looks at the big picture. Every moment for Paul is about eternity. Every incident is about God and light and darkness and grace and truth and heaven and hell and eternity. And I can hear you thinking, that's pretty intense. Yeah, Yeah, but it works. I mean, if there are people today who are wondering about Christianity, wondering, you know, I need some stability in my life. I wonder if this could be helpful to me. You're heading in the right direction, but but with the wrong way. Because you're thinking about process. You need to start with, is Christianity true? If Christianity is true, then there is a personal God who is infinite, 
who came to us through Jesus Christ. And, and if those things are true, there is the possibility of stability. But if God doesn't exist, civilization someday will end when the sun burns out and it really makes no difference, and so there's not going to ever be any stability. But don't begin by asking if Christianity will help. It'll only help if it's true. <coughs> we can't avoid the big issues. My friend was talking about Flannery O'Connor. Do you guys know Flannery O'Connor? She's a Christian writer, a Southerner, and she wrote some essays on, on the relationship of, of dogma, which is you know, the system of belief, like Protestantism or Stoicism, if it's something else. So the relationship of, of a system of belief to truth and creativity. And she wrote the essay because people were constantly coming up to her and telling her that, that, that dogma and truth, all the stuff that she's writing about, how can anybody know what's true? Doesn't it just stifle your creativity? And ironically, she said the same people were, that were asking about that connection between her faith and her writing and her creativity were the same ones who were always morally outraged about any kind of hypocrisy. And she said to them, my job as an artist is to show what is. And nobody can know what is without dogma, without places in, systematically to put it. Um, she said, to be an artist is to know myself, and to know myself is to measure myself against the truth and never the other way around. In other words, if there's no dogma, if there's no system of beliefs, why get upset at hypocrisy? If there's no dogma, if there's no system of beliefs, you really can't get morally outraged at anything. But people are morally outraged because there is truth. They just choose not to deal with it. They choose not to submit to it. You can't, Flannery O'Connor says, and Paul says, avoid the big issues. There is no peace without truth. So then Paul goes to show us how to apply the principle. So three ways. Prayer, moderation, and, and the presence of God. And in fact, you could probably call them disciplines. So with prayer, it allows us to see circumstances through the lens of the wisdom of God. So he's, you know, you've heard me read already, do not be anxious about anything, but if, if you don't do what Paul says, then you're going to end up with anxiety. So don't be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So Paul is advocating a type of prayer, thanksgiving prayer. And we know that there's other types of prayer. There's confession that we're going to go into pretty soon. There's praise, praying for others, there's praying for ourselves. But Paul says you need to be thankful in prayer. Do you want to be stable? Remember to pray thanks to God. But I can hear what you're thinking right now. How can I be thankful unless I know I'm going to get the right answer from God that I want? And the purpose is to thank God ahead of time for all the possible answers that could come from your prayer. If God is wise and if God is loving, he will be so also in answering your prayer. So thank him ahead of time without knowing the answers. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for God to them that love God. God didn't create the chaos that the world is currently in. Sin and suffering are a result of us pulling away from God, not God forsaking us and the world. God has a plan that includes everything in your life, good and bad, designed to build us up and to, or to grow us. So stronger Christians... Uh, Stronger believers in Jesus than myself would say it like this. If you're a child of God, everything that happens to you, that God lets happen to you, must be necessary. And so, I, what is this then? Blind trust? I mean, look at all the, the, the terrible things that happen, and I'm supposed to trust blindly? Well, what are the alternatives? What's the alternative to trust? You know, <clears throat> Daisy, God love her. She goes in our backyard with a, with a pot, and she loves to make soup. And she gets some water out of the fountain with the fish in it, 
Um, and she gets some flowers and, and crumbles them up and puts it in there, and then she gets some dirt for texture, and she calls that soup. <clears throat> I've had to stop her a couple times uh, from eating that. I suspect she doesn't eat it now because she, I didn't catch her once or twice. Um, she thinks it looks good, but I know that even one little spoonful can really hurt her. And, and you and I are, in a lot of ways, we're like Daisy. We think we know what's good for us and what isn't. But I know that milk is good for her. I know carrots are good for her, and that's what she should eat, and not this soup that she's made. So if someone says, listen, I think God is arbitrary and, and bad until he explains why what has happened happened, then by that logic, Daisy should run away because she's upset because I won't let her eat what she wants to. Or someone could say, well, bad things happen because God doesn't exist. But then you have a bigger problem. Because if God doesn't exist, neither does evil. I mean, what happens is just what happens. The universe is random. There's no use complaining or anything. But if you believe in God, then there is the problem of evil. We believe in God, so we know that some things are evil. Russia invading Ukraine, that's evil. We know it's evil. But I must be saying that based on some standard of good, which ends up being God. But if God is who I think he is, really smart, knows all of time, is good, then it must be that God has a reason that I don't understand yet to allow what has happened to happen. And the ultimate example of this is the cross. You know, the disciples weren't excited about the cross. Jesus kept preparing him. This is coming. You have to get ready for this. Um, and, and when Jesus is arrested, what did they do? They ran away and hid. They couldn't see what possible good God could bring from Jesus' death. The greatest moment in the history of our relationship with God. And they ran away and hid in fear for their lives because they didn't understand what God could do with that. A Christian says, I'm not going to run away and hide like the disciples at the cross. I'm going to realize that there's a lot more going on in the world and in my life than I understand. And Lord, I don't know why this is happening, but I'm going to thank you ahead of time. The next idea is moderation. Verse 4 and 5, rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And some versions say patience or, or moderation. The, world, the word actually means this radical evenness of temper. Paul tells the Corinthians in chapter 7 of the, of the first letter, he says, we will not be here forever. So let, those with wives, um, so let those with wives live as if they had none. Let, let they that weep as though they weep not. Those that rejoice as though they rejoice not. Those that buy as, as if they possess not. For the fashion of the world is passing away. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, paraphrased that and he said this, if you understand grace, if you really understand grace and what God's doing, it makes the worst times in your life bearable, survivable, and it makes the best times leavable. That a Christian weeps but says, this loss isn't my main thing. It's not my reason for living. And when something good and wonderful happens, a Christian rejoices, but they don't lose their head over it. They don't lose who they are. They don't get too excited because that's not their main thing. It's not their reason for living. The main thing that can't be touched by circumstances, as Paul says, is that your names are written in, in the book of heaven. Jesus says the same thing to the disciples when they return from their little mission trip in, in Luke 10. He says to them, and they come back and they're so excited. I don't know if you remember this. Um, and they said, oh, we cast out all these demons. And Jesus said, don't, don't rejoice because you cast demons out. Rejoice because your names are written in the book of life. Don't rejoice too much. Don't get too low. Casting out demons isn't the main thing. And if you remember that, it'll, it'll moderate you. Your highs won't bring you too high. Your lows aren't too low. You apply the big truths in the little circumstances. Verse 7, if you do these things, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds. And the last thing is, if you keep seeing your circumstances through prayer and then moderate your excitement 
eventually we learn to seek God, not just his peace, but really seek him. And we begin to feel God's presence more and more. And that feeling is just overwhelming. And it has the power to overwhelm our fears and takes us beyond them into this place of peace no matter what. And it's stability in the midst of the chaos. Standing firm means taking all the big ideas and putting them into the mundane frustrations, the real places of pain in our lives. Trusting God is the key to stability if you want it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do need to trust you in all things and see that that stabilizes us um, in this world that, that's so chaotic, whether it's chaos that's put upon us or that, that we create ourselves. So I ask you, Lord, that, that to help us trust you with all things. And as we come into this time of confession, well, another thing that we need to trust you with completely is our sinfulness and our brokenness, that we are not whole people, that we have done things and said things and even thought things that are not reflective of, of who you are in our lives. So as we approach your throne, Lord, bring up the things that need to be confessed uh, so that you can redeem them, that you can transform us and, and heal us wholly. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, for the things that we have said that were painful to others that we wish we could take back, Lord, we apologize for the things that we have done and failed to do that um, were done out of a self-centeredness, a brokenness deep in us. We apologize for those things too, for the ways that we take for granted those who are closest to us. We apologize and ask that you would take our apology, take our, our grief at how we have taken you for granted and, and use that, Lord, to transform us to be more like the people that you created us to be, loving and, and kind and gentle and peaceful. Lord, be a stabilizing presence in our lives. Help us to keep the main thing the main thing. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that we are broken, we are sinners, but God is a God that loves people like us. And so because of Jesus, we are forgiven, and that is good news. Amen. Please stand. We're going to sing of God's love together. I could sing of your love forever. And the sea, your river runs of love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. Help me to be in the truth. And I will take the truth with me. Your river runs of love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. Help me to be in the truth. And I will take the truth with me. Your river runs of love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free.
So one of the people that is largely unheralded here because he's in the back is James Hoog. And James is in Las Vegas today. And um, taking his place is Daniel. And so I'm very grateful for Daniel for doing all the sound today. Um, and I'm always grateful for James, but I don't say it enough. Um, and uh, Tyler's back there too. It's his birthday? Is that right? So if you remember Tyler from when he, when he was really little, go ahead and tell him stories about himself from back then. He'll, he'll just love it. Um, please join us for um, uh, sort of some fellowship time and some snacks. It's, it's all to the good. Let me bless us before we go. Lord, send us out from this place of, of worship and joy. Send us out with you, with your presence into the world, with the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit, with the joy of Jesus Christ and the strength of God the Father. And the people of God say, Hallelujah. Amen.